soundtrack is so legendary, but the big song in there, which really, which really, there's three, right? It's Don Shane, Twist and Shout, yeah. and, then, and then there's another song in there that nobody knows the title of. I don't know who sings it. <laughs> I just know to go. The title, but the title is "Oh Yeah." It's by Yellow. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> this. This song, I can't tell no. you how often I like listen. The Kool Aid Man song. made it. Oh man, so, so, somebody made it, and like, and like, somebody was just like, you know, hanging around like Jason, you know, and said, you know what, you know that. <laughs> why don't I we turn that, that tool? <laughs> <laughs> welcome back, welcome back to back to the classic cinematic movie podcast. Thanks back to iconic films of twenty years ago. Uh, oh, you're on day, like five. Uh, I'm not even going to get into where you can find us at. Uh, make sure you check out all the links that we post to our videos below so you can see uh, where we are. I am your guy, Danger Neff, and with me is our co-host <laughs> from Cinema Rehab, the one and only Duval Brown, D. Brown. How are you, sir? I'm good. I'm good. I'm just trying to imagine Jason in a studio booth going, chicka, chicka. <laughs> <laughs> hanging out there and like with like but machete. i feel like yeah. you know, the machete is like his comfort like, tool you know oh yeah <laughs> get his bear <laughs> zemo on <laughs> uh how you doing sir oh good i'm how's good i'm good i am so happy to be here um we haven't done an episode in a long time so i'm gonna have mad fun with this one it's a good one so i'm ready it's definitely a good one. How cinema rehab? How how how's that? Uh, how's that? Cinema old? rehab is a beautiful thing. Me and um Selena, we get to geek out on some cool stuff. Uh, we got a couple. We got some really good things that we we had a a small meeting amongst ourselves, and we we got some stuff that we're gonna bring to the streets <laughs> that need to be. We got some arguments coming up. <laughs> That's gonna be good. I can't wait. I really can't wait. Selling, we're gonna be slinging some product around here. We're gonna be slinging some. We're gonna be slinging some product. <laughs> Shout outs to everybody that watched Snowfall. We're gonna get on our Franklin shit. <laughs> uh, this week was, uh, we're actually gonna cover kind of two things uh, these past two weeks. We apologize for not being on last week. Uh, I, I got the COVID vaccine. And while I'm not going to share my feelings on how that went, I will tell you that that day I was in literal hell. Uh, I didn't get a whole lot of sleep uh, the night before. Um, because of that, we also had some scheduling conflicts kind of come in and people not doing what they say they were going to do. And so there's not a lot that we can really say or do. So we apologize. We will be returning back to that movie uh, that we were going to do, which is Trading Places. Uh, sometime down uh, down the line, but uh, anyways, we're back here. We're taking this back. I, I this was a personal favorite of mine. Um, I feel like if you if you talk about '80s April, if you want to talk about '80s movies, it's really really hard not to get into the John Hughes movies, and there's a lot of them. You know, I could easily talk about Breakfast Club. I could easily talk about. Uh, we science, do 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 Interesting, interesting thing that you put out there with the with the weird science versus Breakfast Club thing. I did that on purpose. I did that um, on purpose. I would probably go Breakfast Club myself. I do like I do like weird science. I love I, weird science. Um, Robert Daddy Jr. had a bra on his head <laughs> for that. I, just, I I just really 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 love Breakfast Club for for exactly what it is. But I mean, when you think of the eighties, like. Like we kind of talk about how we talk about like Marvel Cinematic Universes and whatnot. Yeah. There was literally a John Hughes universe where like all of this shit is probably connected some way, shape, or form. Or there's always like little stuff they kind of do little winks on. You know, um, it, it's it's pretty it, it's pretty amazing. I mean, I mean, just to think about it. I mean, he was a writer on Vacation. Uh, he directed Sixteen Candles. He directed uh, Breakfast Club. He was a writer for European Vacation. He was a director of mm -hmm. Weird Science. He was a writer on Pretty in Pink. He was the director of Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Uh, mm -hmm. He was he was writer and director of Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, as well oh, as oh man, writer, classic, classic, as well as uh, as well as the writer for The Great Outdoors. He was the director and writer for Uncle Buck, my my personal favorite John Candy movie. Um, uh, he was the writer for Christmas Vacation. He was the writer for Home Alone. 
He was, you know, he, he did director, uh, director writing for Curly Sue, Home Alone 2, Dennis the Menace, like anything in every, uh, Miracle on 34th Street that came out in, in mm-hmm. uh, 94, which is, again, a really, really solid flick. Like he had his hands in just about everything for the longest time. Um, and it's tough to pick one John Hughes movie. You can't. You can't. That's impossible. And I that on purpose because those two films were right before uh, Ferris Bueller. I said, okay, let, let's talk about the films before we got to Ferris Bueller, which is not if Ferris Bueller is not in your top 10 80s movies, you're doing the 80s wrong. <laughs> you are doing the 80s wrong. It makes it my top off. 10. You're just, yeah. you're, you're wrong and you're completely off. But so why did I choose Ferris Bueller? Um, yeah. I actually am going to use a quote from Ben Stein, who was called in to do this. And at the time, Ben Stein was actually Ben Stein was actually uh, an economics professor at the time when he was called in by John Hughes to come and do so. And he says the following: the most life affirming movie possibly of the entire post war period. This is to comedies what Gone with the Wind is to epics. It will never die because it responds to and calls forth such human emotions. It isn't dirty. There's nothing mean-spirited about it. There's nope. nothing sneering or sniggering about it. It's just wholesome. We want to be free. We want to have a good time. We know we're not going to be able to uh, uh, be able to all our lives. We know mm-hmm. we're going to have to buckle down and work. We know we're going to have to eventually become family men and women and have responsibilities and pay bills. But just give us a couple of good days that we can look back on. And you know what? That is a perfect description for this movie because – the 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 big line in this movie the like the the big like quote in this movie yeah. is, is 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 obviously you know it, it's it was utilized by nancy reagan in a speech you know mm-hmm. life moves pretty fast mm-hmm. you know if you don't take a second if you don't take a second to look around it might just go it, it might just pass you on pass you by man pass you know by, you know and when i think about that and i think about like my early 20s and i think about you know coming out of high school that stuck so much with me because I wanted to live every single day. And look, mm-hmm. like my days nowadays are, are are pretty are pretty whatever. Like I work, I do this, I walk my dog. It's it's a very very simplistic you know life. <laughs> and I wouldn't trade anything for that. But when I look back on some of my better days, like it just it it reflects to me you know to my travels into Europe and North Africa, you know it reflects to me. Uh, to the many different cities that I've been to, um, yeah. experiences I've I, I've had to to have, and it's days like this, you know, that make me that that you know make you nostalgic and make you long for this, and that yeah. is something this movie hits on so badly, so big. Original release date June eleventh, nineteen eighty six. It actually shares opening weekend. This is this is kind of an insane like weekend. Um, it, uh, it shared it with Raw Deal in My Little Pony, the movie. It also <laughs> have to be sharing. That's a wild box of this. We it could go see Arnold Schwarzenegger kill people, or we it, could go see Ferris Bueller. It's also sharing with Top Gun and Short Circuit and Critters and Poltergeist 2. What a time is, to be alive. What that, a time, that was, time to be alive. If, if, bro. Think about going to the movies in the 1980s and you had all that. Like that was what a time to be like critters was my shit. Man. Critters, oh my god. Is super Short crazy. circuit one. Exactly. So much memories, man. Yo, that was a wild box office. That's a wild box right. office. I would have snuck in every fucking movie if I was a kid. <laughs> yeah, same here. Every man. one. Like, yeah. Like everything, everything about that box office just said, just says to me, "Wow, I really, really need to spend like a whole weekend at the movies." And then some. Uh, yeah. Holds a seventy nine percent on Rotten Tomatoes from critics, but a ninety two percent by audiences. Duvall, is that fair? The audience score is fair. The critic score, nah, nah. I feel like it has to be a little bit higher. I would, I would, I would bring it to an eighty five at yeah. least. I'll bring it to 85. I don't think I, critics is just weird. You know, we're very critical over things. And 
when it comes to Ferris Bueller, it's a tough one because Ferris Bueller, he breaks the fourth wall. He's talking to the audience. Like, like, like that the film itself is such an exaggerated adventure that it kind of goes over some people's heads a little bit. I understand that. So you have to be having fun to watch Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And there's probably people that walk walked into that thing and was like, what the fuck am I watching? Like, what is this? Like, you know what I'm saying? Right. Even for a John Hughes movie, you know what I'm saying? But it's a John Hughes comedy movie of a kid literally ditching school, you know what I'm saying? Like, right. you know, and you get a couple of life lessons in the middle of that, you know what I'm saying? I don't know. It's just, I, I just, critics are weird. That's all, man. Just right. give that shit an 85 or 90. Why are y'all playing around? <laughs> it's so weird. Um, and it's so weird. It just it, it, it's it's this movie is so impactful, like it, it it while it didn't invent the notion of like planning Easter eggs like after the credits, it no. was like one of the first mainstream movies to li- to literally to kill it. it. Um, it gave it gave us like it gave us fashion statement with sweater vests and yeah. hockey jerseys, you know, for yeah. the uh, for the longest time. Like it, it's it's quotable. It makes here's here's what I love so much about this. So many movies that like take place in New York does a really good job of show of showcasing New York, right? Like yeah. it's it's going to show you know the big uh, the big stuff at, in Manhattan, Manhattan, you know, Times Square, and, yeah, yeah. Manhattan Cathedral to to Times Square to you know eventually you get out past Battery Park and you're seeing right. you the Liberty, you know, right? You know you're seeing you're seeing uh, the G uh, the GW Bridge, you're seeing all of right. Brooklyn, and of course you're seeing the Brooklyn Bridge, you know, right? And 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 Central Park. And you know when you're watching a New York movie because you know exactly when you're watching a New York movie. Right. Like, like there's so many iconic things about uh, about New York that it's tough not to mention like like la- like a landscape item. That R.I.P. the Twin Towers, the Empire right. State Building, everything. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Liberty right. Island, right. all right. that. Not only, but not only that, but it's so difficult for a New York movie not to show something to make it feel like you are in New York. Right. right. This movie makes you feel like you're in Chicago. Like yeah. actually like like showcasing Chicago. Yeah. And I feel that. I really, really do. I like movies. It, like it was it was a vibe. Day. They had a nice little you can cut school, but you can cut school with style, yo. Like right. you know what I'm saying? Like you didn't and, go into the city. Like, yeah. like you can cut school, but you know what you're doing. You're you're drinking off the water tower. It's Cameron, man. He did it for Cameron, even though he planned it. Like from from the beginning, oh, he's like, I gotta impress Cameron on this. He said, Cameron, you're such a oh, you, your Asperger syndrome is like gonna mess up our day off. I'm gonna show you everything cool about Chicago. <laughs> exactly. You got no choice but to love it. <laughs> exactly. So, um, let's kick this movie off. Uh, let's I, kick I, it. it. It's tough to kind of say is there a linear storyline to this because there is, but there isn't. Um, there's a lot of plot threads in this one. There's, there's a lot. <laughs> yeah, but it's also not super complicated to kind of like, nah. like figure out. Um, no. Obviously, you're in suburban Chicago, and it's pretty close to the end of the school year. You know, you're mm-hmm. you're you're getting kids that are just they're checked out. They're they're either ready for summer vacation or they're ready to graduate. Especially if Ben Stein is their teacher. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and and this kicks off with Ferris Bueller faking sickness and when i say that matthew broderick hams up this performance like yo like everything about it is mad just- funny mad funny and what's funny is i haven't seen it in a while and his performance in the beginning to like convince his parents that he's sick i'm like this was so corny but then he's like this was one of my worst performances ever i said you know what i forgot <laughs> your ferris bueller like he's like he's just laying there looking dead you know like genie Papa? genie is that you <laughs> is that you oh, i love it i love every minute of it his hands is clammy he's like i, I got a test today I, I don't I want to be I'll something when I grow up. I'll get up. I got to get up. <laughs> I want to get into a good school. Cool. <laughs> oh, man. Like, oh, my God. Like, at the end of it, you're just like, oh, my God. This kid is hamming it up. And oh, I'm, man. I'm like, there's no way. There's no way. No way the parents, like, 
not not fall for this. Like, yo, like, man, early Matthew Browick is the shit, man. War Games, Glory, man, man, my man, my man was he was a talented dude back then. You know, what I'm, saying? I'm not saying he was. I'm not saying he evolved into a bad actor. It's just I don't think they used Matthew Broderick in future programs better. You know, what I'm saying like this was him. Not, this was not, him. We're not going to talk about Godzilla. We're not going to talk about Godzilla. I promise my me and Jay do this all the time. Godzilla, some I don't know why this damn Toby Emmerich <laughs> Godzilla keeps getting brought back up. But <clears throat> Matthew, you should have never did that movie, bro. <laughs> that is an asterisk <laughs> on your resume. Like uh, anywho, right. I tried to think about all the quintessential 80s dudes that could have been Ferris Bueller, like maybe Michael J. Fox or Eric Stoltz or Andrew McCartney and all of them. But to be honest with you, no, this was Matthew Broderick's movie. This had to be Matthew Broderick. It had to be him. It had exactly. to be. Um, you know, I know, I know a couple guys I were really, like thought of. Uh, John Cusack probably was definitely thought of. Ooh, close, uh, close. Um, close. Um, Rob, no. Lowe, Rob Lowe would have been in the conversation as well. You know, uh, even no. even Ro- even Downey uh, uh, during Downey that- maybe Downey Downey, maybe. Downey Downey is probably Downey the- maybe. Oh, Yo, I might even have gave it to Anthony Michael Hall a little bit, but Anthony Michael Hall, no, he was close no, though not. in terms of in terms of charisma that could have did it that could have so- pulled it off. Because right around that time, Anthony Michael Hall was kind of funny. You know what I'm saying? He was funny enough to, to pull it off. And, and that's his homie. That's John Hughes' is homie. I want to hit a little bit on Ferris's character. Because yeah. so much so much of Ferris's character, and this is, this is a very, very, very tough line that I think directors and writers have, have difficulty doing. Because it's mm-hmm. kind of like, oh, he's a lovable character. But then you like sit there and it's like, well, he did some really fucked up shit. I can't say anything that Ferris did today was absolutely fucked up. Like, like on that day, he he was playing his own game, but there was nothing that he did that was fucked up. If anything, it it, it was the difference between being like a thief, like stealing something, and then being a manipulator. He was a mad manipulator, though. Well, he, kind of, but yeah, but it, but but it wasn't it wasn't manipulation that he was doing. It was yeah. more like it was more like he knew he knew that Cameron needed it, right? He knew that right. Cameron needed this more than anything else, right? And sure, he was getting something out of it as well, but but he was still like he was still in his mind like he was kind of looking out for Cameron also. Yeah, you're my boy. Like you, I'm not gonna have a day off without my boy, even though right. I do need your dad's whip. <laughs> right, you're still I know my I boy. I need the whip, yeah. obviously. But yeah. I'm not going to go all out for this kind of thing. Yeah, we we taking the whip. On the film. He says, this is my ninth my ninth absence. Like, nine, like, times. You, you go, nine times. Nine times. Nine times. Like, I need I need to go. I need to do. I need we need to, to go ham on this one. Yeah, you, you just need to go all out for it. And you know what? Yeah. I respect that. I respect, I, I respect. I respect him, like, saying, you know what? Like I gotta make sure this is this is big. But what I was saying about the the writing of the character, yeah. it's not so much that like he's a thief. He's more like a lovable rogue. Like, yeah. sure, he gets away with some stuff. He gets away yeah. with a, he gets away with a lot. But it's not like he sat sat there afterwards and you're just like, boy, that guy's a dick. Nobody, no, I don't think anybody would actually think that. Nah, that he's a lovable. Dick. Yeah, he's, he's cool. He's a lovable. He's the lovable villain, but he's a lovable anti-hero in a way. <laughs> Which is so difficult for for people to write characters nowadays, right? Because, because you always feel like they have to like teeter into that gray line. I always right. feel like he pushed up to the boundary, but never decided to cross into it. No, no, no. He knew he knew his limit. He knew his limit. He exactly. knew his limit, especially towards the end of the film. But anyways, we'll we'll, we'll get more into that. Yeah. Um, the other thing that. It's great about Ferris is that he constantly breaks the fourth wall. Love and it. Honestly, I'm really trying to think about this. I really think this is the first movie I ever saw with a character going out of their way to break the fourth wall. I've seen it done, but I've never seen it done to this extent. Like the amount of times that he's doing it, I've even tried to look. I said, yo, is there another movie that I could think in my head that breaks the fourth wall this much? And nah, not really. I think Ferris Bueller at least, is at least not early on. I mean, I mean, obviously, Deadpool right. immediately. 
what well, Deadpool paid homage. He paid homage to it, you know, right. with his with his um <clears throat> after credit scene, which which was clever because he's breaking the fourth wall like literally right. the whole movie. I but knew, I knew uh the first time it was used was in the 1950s with the George Burns and a uh, Gracie Allen show. Oh, right. Um, but you know, other than that, like like you'll get House of Cards immediately comes to mind. Oh um, yeah, uh, with absolutely. The Bernie, uh, the Bernie the Bernie Mac show. Bernie Mac so all day. effectively did it so effectively. Yes, the, um, America, <laughs> America, <laughs> America. You know he was he pissed. Knew. He you knew know he was he pissed was if he was talking to America. He's like America. I'm gonna beat these kids ass. <laughs> <laughs> so getting it. So so moving on a little bit a little bit further. Of course, because he's excused, he kind of immediately calls uh, Cameron, who <laughs> feels better when he's sick, played by Alan Ruck. And first of all, it always creeped me out because one of my closest friends growing up looks exactly like the, like Alan Ruck. Like, really? a man, man, like nowadays I see him and he kind of has like his goatee and slick back hair and whatnot. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah, but no, you're Cameron. Like, like <laughs> that's it. You're Cameron. <laughs> like, like he felt better. He, like Cameron's the kind of guy that just his life is so shitty. He would yeah. rather be sick than be well. And it's not because he was naturally a sick person. He just he was so stuck in a bad environment that, yeah. he, and he had no backbone for himself. And a lot of this is a coming age, a coming of age story of Cameron, mm -hmm. more so than Ferris. Ferris, Ferris has a dilemma in the future. But it's one of those things that he's not going to be able to solve today. It's going right. to have to be, and, and and he's okay with that. But he's aware of the problem that's going uh, that's going to wind up coming. Um, yeah. But you know, when you get Cameron, like he is, he, he's he's such a hypochondriac, you know, that it, it, that's ridiculous. When he finally gets to pick, uh, when he finally gets to pick him up, you know, uh, like in the vehicle, like. Like even like even Ferris was all like he's probably like sitting there in his vehicle contemplating whether whether or not he's going to come. Uh, go. <laughs> and you get this whole scene, and he's just like he's just going to keep calling. Oh, keep I love calling, I love the calling, Ferris Bueller call him back. Ferris Bueller said, "You're not dying." <laughs> <laughs> and then hung up. Said all he said what he needed to say. And hung up. <laughs> I just like this image of Alan Brock sitting there in the car, like he's going to just keep calling. And keep calling and calling. Mm -hmm. He's not going to leave me alone. You know, he got out of the car, like headed yeah. back into the house, and he was just like, like pissed off at himself, and finally, like. <laughs> <picked up. laughs> and of course, um, that's his boy. Though that's his best friend. His best friend knows his best friend. So, and of course, this is all to kind of lure uh, Ferris's girlfriend, uh, Sloan Peterson, who's played by the incredible Mia Sarah in this, mm. and. This was again a bit of a controversial casting because at that time, the John Hughes girl at that time was Molly Ringwald. Like so, to have somebody completely, completely different to to play it. But he even like made commentary on this, where he's like, "This was not a role for her. Like she wasn't ready for this kind of a role." Nah, it was weird nah. because Mia Sarah was younger than Molly Ringwald. Right, she was eighteen years old when she did this. Mia she Sarah had like that, that different kind of look to her. You know, like. Like she it could have been a sure look. Like she could have been a Phoebe Cates, but they said, "Nah, we looking for something else." You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, yeah, right. like. And Sloan is Sloan is Sloan's perfect. Like she's the girl next door. She's super sexy. She's well aware of her sexuality. She's oh yeah, well, she's well high. aware of her sex. Sexuality. Yo, well, she grew she grew up to be hot too. She's like the wife and time cop. I said, "Go ahead, me and Sarah. Yes. Go ahead, go That's ahead the movie man. I want to cover." That's oh man, we're gonna cover Tom Cobb. Tom Cobb is one of my favorite John Claude, Claude, Claude Van Damme movies, hands down. That's the JCVD I want to cover. Tom uh, hey, Mia Sarah, you deserve your roses. You're fine. Every time I've Absolutely. seen you in Hollywood, mm. so and she's perfect in this. Like, I don't want to. It's not that she doesn't have a personality. It's she's absolutely beautiful, and she and she understands that this is all planned out by, uh, by uh, by Ferris. But right. at the same, but first of all, it's hilarious. Like, like when the nurse comes walking in, you know, <laughs> she's immediately like starting to get her shit together. Like she already knew, like she was going, like she was going to be like, oh. like kicked away. <laughs> and um, and uh, part of the 
part of this whole uh, this whole ruse obviously is to get into uh, uh, is to get into Chicago. But I want to into I want to talk about some of these little side characters before we get into kind of that main definitely movie. definitely. And I first want to talk about Ben Stein, who is an economics professor, is playing as an economics professor, and brilliantly. <laughs> and it, it's brilliant he's going down he's going down the list and ben stein has the best monotone boring voice oh my ever. god that yeah. that scene where the kids are like fucking just drooling and, and sleep and, and clap and, oh <laughs> anyone anderson when uh <laughs> bueller he's, like, he's, like, he's, all, he's all like he's all like explaining <laughs> stuff he's all like he's all like and in the 1930s when the great <laughs> anyone 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 did you know, uh, try to increase, uh, try to increase or decrease anyone. Yo, and they were like, yo, I seen one kid literally sleep, but awake. He was like, <laughs> <laughs> some kid had his head down, and you could see the pile of drool. The puddle. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been there before. I know what that puddle is. I've been like, oh my god. <laughs> but it's fair, like, like. Ben Stein, hey, I, I did notice somebody in class. I did notice somebody in class. Did you notice the blonde chick that was covering for Furious? Uh, no. Who is it? The blonde chick was Christy Swanson, Buffy the Vampire herself. You're absolutely right. That is Christy Swanson. Yo, but I, she's so distinct. Like, you just <laughs> know who she is when you see her kind of deal. But right. her part, even though it was minimal, it was so, I was like, Christy, you did, a, you did good, Christy. Right. You did good. And this, there, one of the kind of subplots of the story is that there's a lie that Ferris has kind of told all the freshmen that basically he may need a kidney transplant. And when I say that somehow this, the word of this has spread across all of Chicago, it's fucking ridiculous. Yeah. This made to the front page of the Chicago Tribune. Yeah. The yeah. Tribune in the 80s was one of the most respected papers in the world. Yeah, like, like he got front front page, bro. They put his name up on Wrigley. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yo, we're rooting for him. Tell him I hope he feels better. Yo, he got everybody. Yo, yo, telling the guys, the guys on the force are rooting for him. <laughs> <laughs> yo, Jennifer Gray was pissed the whole movie too. Like, what the right, fuck? <laughs> which is the second character I wanted to cover, Jennifer Cray. Who is, oh, who is she's awesome. excellent in this movie? She she's excellent. awesome in this movie. She really is. She is um, excellent in this movie. Like Jeannie Bueller, who is <laughs> Ferris, uh, who is his Ferris' sister, and her whole thing is, and and it's it's kind of reasonable where where she's tired of Ferris kind of gain away with all these little ploys and all these little little games. I get it, and yeah. for an eighties movie, I also get it. But even at the end of the movie, like when she realizes, like, like, wow, I'm just kind of being a bitch just to be a bitch after a while, and she really was, like, it was, it was really. And easy. even it, and her voice of reason <laughs> was <Right>. Carlos Estevez. <laughs> man, man, that is a hell. That let me tell you something. That was a hell. That's of a bad cameo. when he's the voice of reason. <laughs> that was a hell of a cameo back then. He um, killed it. He killed it. So. Okay, so and Jeannie, of course, wants to try to catch Ferris and, and basically everything. The other person that wants to catch Ferris um, is the very controversial Jeffrey Jones. Ooh, uh, controversial. Dean of students. And the reason why I say controversial is back in 2003, <sighs> uh, Jeffrey Jones was actually found with like child pornography. Yeah, um, man. And, and it was kind of a big it was kind of a big deal. Um, for for him because it was uh, you know I don't want to say it kind of came out of left field or anything but you know Jones Jones was kind of a kind of a well known actor at that point he's still working um because he's, he's in a lot of stuff he's, he's in a still, lot of stuff he still he still worked on Deadwood after after. Yeah. But it's not. it's not as you don't see him spearheading anything anymore. Like remember, like back in the day when he used to be like mom and dad saved the world, and it's his movie. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, like he's in like Howard the Duck. Howard the Duck, uh, or yeah, Ed or Ed what's Ed. what's another one? He's in everything. You remember? Stay tuned. He was, in, he was in the Devil's Advocate. The um, Devil's Advocate. Stay tuned with him and John Ritter. That was my jam, yo. Was that was the, my jam. He was in the past. Oh, the. <laughs> No, he was in Who's Your Caddy, I think. 
I think Jeffrey Jones. There's a part of me that wants to cover the pest. Because the past, is, so the past is funny. It's funny. It is funny, but man, that's a bad movie. But it's funny it's, as hell. It's it's pretty bad. Um, but for uh, but you know, he's he kind of did. Uh, he, he was arrested for possession of child pornography and accused by seventeen year old boy soliciting. Um, he pleaded no contest. Um, and uh, the whole the whole thing was that he had five years probation. And he had to register as a sex offender, um, which is still to this day he is still a sex offender. And will probably be on there and on the registry for the rest of his days. But at least in this role, um, Jeffrey Jones' uh, character Ed Rooney is man. He is a bad guy that you love. You love everything that happens to him because yeah. his whole thing is like he has no problem holding back Ferris for a year, and it's like why? Like why do you, why do you care at that point? Yeah, why? Like, why? Like, why exactly are you are you fa- are you fighting this? I think I think Ed Rooney and Jeannie just <laughs> was just tired of Ferris's shit. Like they were just there. Like, but he was the one that could do something about it. And probably on a good day, Jeannie probably would have helped them. Right. But obviously, she had her moment of clarity. You know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> uh, the other the other person that kind of steals the show a little bit is the secretary. Um, Eddie I love her. Oh my god, and I love her. I don't think anybody realizes like she's still pretty popular, like like in everything. She does a lot of voice acting for Disney. Do now. you remember her? She was so annoying. She was the annoying bitch <laughs> in the Elvira movie. You remember the Elvira yes, TV ab- movie? Yes, absolutely. She was Chastity. <laughs> oh my yes, god, I remember the character. Oh man, when she was. Um, and they made and Elvira made the pie that made them turn free, freaky at the at the party. <laughs> Absolutely, she. But she's done. Oh God, she did so many, so many amazing movies. Like like she was in Natural Born Killers as Mallory's mm-hmm. mom. Um, she was uh, in uh, uh, the Rugrats movie. She was the voice yep. of the nurse. Yeah, um, she has an excellent voice. So she's a great voice actress. She is, and it's why she's like stuck around. She was in The Little Mermaid as Carlotta. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Now I hear it. Now I hear it. No doubt. Yeah. yeah. Um, she, she, like I said, she's just been. You could literally go and look on her, her IMDb, and she's she's always in everything. She was in Cars too. She was. In- I wouldn't even be surprised if she was in SpongeBob because I saw the talented cast of that. I say, yo, there are a lot of voices in this situation that I didn't know about. So I wouldn't be surprised. She looked like she would have de- definitely been in there. Um. Definitely. But anyways, so. You have these three char- these four characters, and they all kind of bring uh, something a little bit different to to everything. Uh, Eddie McClurg's uh, character, the secretary, her name is Grace, by the way, which <laughs> isn't even which isn't even really listed, but uh, she. Uh, Grace. 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 But but she's like stuck in the 1960s, like yeah, you know, and whatnot. But you know, she's like, aren't you supposed to be in like this class or whatever? Um, <laughs> Meanwhile, like Jeffrey Jones had this whole thing, and Cameron uh, decided to act as Sloan Stevens' like father, where there's like this conversation, and and like uh, and like thinking that it's Ferris Bueller that that he's basically catching, you know, <laughs> because he literally, he literally like looks at the computer, and the days of absences absences are just lowering itself down. Which I'm like, I know you're doing a whole war games thing here, but yeah. come on, man. <laughs> Anyways, yo, Ferris was too cool for school, man. He wasn't yeah. having that. Ne- yo, he covered all his bases. Yo, he was on point. I love Ferris Bueller, dude. What? When they decided to finally take the 1961 Ferrari 250 GT California Spider Woo! out to uh, out to Chicago, this, Ooh, thing, this, yeah. thing, this thing is a thing of beauty. They decided to park it in a garage, and what is probably the most iconic scene in this film is when. Has nothing to do with Ferris. <laughs> it's these two guys. It's these Even two they guys. had a good one day. Of them, one of them originally was supposed to be played by Bill Paxton. I don't know if you knew that. Um, originally supposed really? To be that would have, you if Bill Paxton would have been in this movie, I would have been down, down, down um, for it, yo. But <laughs> these guys like go and, and bro, when I say it's not even like they hadn't even walked away from the garage. <laughs> <bro>. <laughs> like, they're like, oh yeah, I'll give him a fiver. Like, I'll take, yeah. I'll take, care, I'll, I'll take care of him. I'll give him a fiver. 
Bro, when I say that that these kids literally, I don't, I can't remember how many miles were on the car at that point, but I know. Oh like, yeah, they wild out that way. They wild bro, out. Somehow they got like two thousand miles on that car in like <laughs> hours. <laughs> and it's not fair that. And that's not Ferris's fault. That's not no. Ferris's fault. Like, and you want to feel bad for Cameron, but it's like, yo, he Ferris didn't even do that. <laughs> right. So, so you know, they take off. They fly off this. I love it. They, they. I mean, they're flying, and you're seeing this <laughs> joy in their face. And I'm like, I'm like, yo, like, I get it. I really, really, really get it. Um, they had their day off. They had their little adventure <laughs> now the trio decide to kind of explore the city uh well they don't kind of they absolutely explore the city they see the art institute of chicago they see sears tower they see they explore the city chicago uh mercantile they went to a cubs game right they went to wrigley field uh yeah it's uh, playing against my atlanta braves june 6 1985 was that game there you go there you go um uh, they nearly intersect with their father with, with all, their, the time. All, all the time all the time all the time all the time. All the time. They get into this restaurant in this snooty, like, you know who you look like? You remember Salute Your Shorts? Yes. Okay. You remember the, like, basically who's supposed to be the Roger from Doug of, of that group? Yup. Yup. Like, that's what this waiter looked like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't think of that, of that character. The Roger from Doug. Like that's, but that's what he always reminded me of. Like, mm -hmm. oh my God, salute your shorts. Um, Cause he was just, I don't know, man. Like, yo, shout out to salute your shorts. I don't think Nick gets a lot of its roses. Nick, Nick was the shit back in the day. That's Nick, all we had. Nick had, Nick had its moments. Nick held us down, man. Nick held us down. <laughs> salute your shorts. Nick had its moments. I'll say that. <laughs> yeah, man. But hey, our original Doug. Do 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 la 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 la. He basically like Ferris pulls off this whole. He's the sausage king of Chicago. I don't know why. I don't even know how he pulls this one off. And and you know the friends are all like, "Come on, we'll just go somewhere else. We're gonna get caught." Blah blah blah. But Ferris is like determined to like say, "This guy's not gonna beat me today." Yeah. And of course he 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 beats him. I don't the other thing is I don't know how fairs paid for any of this. <laughs> like like because that looked they like have money, bro. They have money. And what's crazy is I know they had money, but Ferris didn't have a car. <laughs> like that didn't make any sense. Like like you knew they had money, but Ferris didn't have a car. Like, you know right. what I'm saying? So of course Cameron kind of remains worried and Ferris decides to cheer him up. And What's also an iconic scene in this film could technically be considered to cut that out, but but I but I also disagree. Um, where he decides to lip sync to Wayne Newton's cover of Don Quixote while on a float filled with a whole bunch of German uh, 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 German uh, um... a random parade. This is not a holiday. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's a very it's a very popular day in Chicago. It's the von Steuben Day parade. It's it's really it's a very it's kind oh, of oh like, wait what what parade it's the von Steuben day it only happens in Chicago only happens in Chicago like got you okay I didn't know that because I, I, that confused me I said wait why is the parade going on it is <laughs> um, okay so that makes sense does, now that does make sense then he later does this whole thing with the Beatles twist and shout meanwhile back to Rooney. Rooney at this point has decided to show up at, at Ferris's house. And again, I'm not, I'm not going really super linear with this, but Rooney decides to first answer the door, you know, and he pushes this. And let me tell you, here's why this movie is iconic. This movie has taught us in some way, shape, or form, you could do the following uh, uh, in this. You could, do, you could use crash test dummies. <laughs> you could use fake answering machine messages phony phone calls and Casios that make barking sounds in order to perpetuate a very, very, very carefully orchestrated yep. lie because a whole long conversation, you know, Rooney has with, with the doorbell and Ferris would have gotten <laughs> away with it. If he did ring the doorbell a second mm -hmm. time, 
Then Rooney decides to hop over the fence and get attacked. <laughs> by the dog. When I say get attacked by the dog, he, he. I feel like John Hughes always has. I feel like all the John Hughes movies have that setup, or anything he's written. It right. feels Kevin McAllister esque. Like it has that setup to it, like a Casio or a videotape or something plays into that to that scene to make it camouflage something. You know what I'm saying? Right. So this was like the early traces of it, like the early traces of something like that. Could have got away with it, Ferris. Could have got away with it. Now, Jeannie, of course, frustrated by this entire experience, has decided to skip <laughs> class and return home to confront Ferris. You know. And as she does so, she hears somebody actually come into the house. Yo. Rooney, what are you doing, dude? This is breaking in an area now. Yeah. You do it too much. You do it extra. <laughs> like, you're going, you're going above and beyond. So, of course, he gets kicked in the face once, although... Oh, my God, those kicks. Those kicks were hilarious, too. Oh, <laughs> Knocks him out, and his wallet falls on the floor. She phones the police. The police don't believe her, which is something that I'm like, I'm like, yo, like, like white lady in trouble. Like you immediately come to suburban, suburban Chicago. But I guess at that time they didn't care. So she gets picked up by the cops and they place her under arrest for making a false report. So the mom has to collect her from the police station. Meanwhile, the guys decided to take back the Ferrari, right? And it was at, it's, it's the really, really big scene in the movie because you get basically Cameron going catatonic and kind of almost trying to commit suicide, you know, um, by drowning. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it touched on, it touched on a moment, but did you ever feel like he was like always like that? Like just emo, bit, like yeah. he had like, a yeah, like I felt like he, that was there already and they were touching on it with the comedy, but after a while, it finally was like, nah, this, this shit ain't funny no more. Like, Right. So after Cameron basically gets out of it and, and is kind of talking about how overbearing his father is, he, he finally like pents up his frustration and takes it out on this Ferrari. First, yeah. venting the fuck out of this thing. Because yeah. trying, and, and the Ferrari is, is up on a jack and is put into reverse. Part of the <laughs> Which is the dumbest, the dumbest idea. <laughs> it is. It is because they're trying to think that the odometer will go down. Which, yeah. no, it won't. You that's not how really, that. That's you, not how that works, Ferris. <laughs> you literally have to go in there and change it. Yeah. Um, but as uh, as he begins to kind of kick and do so, he goes and he, and he finally like leans into the car, and of course it falls off the jack. Oh my god! And falls into the ravine below. And this car is destroyed, like totally completely. Yeah. Now Ferris offers to take the blame, which shout out to you, my guy. Like, yeah. good on you. But he decides not to. Cameron decides, uh, declines the offer, and he says he's finally going to stand up to his father. Meanwhile, <laughs> is that realistic or, or Bueller, is that real? Bueller, uh, nah. uh, Mrs. Mrs. Bueller arrives at the station where Jeannie has a, a, a very very strong conversation with. With a Carlos Estevez, otherwise known <laughs> as, as a Charlie Sheen, who is playing a drug addict in this. Who is playing himself, by the way, right. y'all. <laughs> and they decide to kind of make out. And the whole reason why is because he's just basically saying, you really should not care about this stuff. This stuff is. Yeah, so like, why? Why you, you? It's like basically someone basically saying, why are you being such a hater? Like, just. Right. Let Ferris do us. Let Ferris do him, and you do you. Have you even figured out what makes you happy? Like you know, what I'm saying kind of deal. <laughs> right. And Ferris gets slown home and realizes that his parents are due at home at any minute. So he decides mm -hmm. to kind of take off on foot throughout the neighborhood. Best he's montage there. ever. Best right. montage this ever. Is, this really is a great montage because he goes through a house. He straight up like bypasses two ladies, like like that. <laughs> he even crazy. came back. He hey, came hi. back. Hi, Ferris Bueller. <laughs> I was like, you know what? Fair enough. Hey, don't get up. So eventually, he jumps on a trampoline and has the slowest fall ever. Which love it. Love Family it. Family Guy did such a great job of making fun of that, um, yeah. and uh, is able to make it home when uh, Rooney discovers Ferris is out and threatens him. But Jeannie- Now, when I was little, that part made my heart drop. I was like, he almost got away with me. Yeah, like that part, because I wasn't expecting it. You know what I'm saying? 
<laughs> and Jeannie decides to open the door right at the same time and thank Mr. Rooney for helping return Ferris from the hospital. You know, thinking that, uh, you know, saying whatever. She then tells Rooney that, that she has his wallet, uh, was on the kitchen floor, that he knows that he broke into the house and uh, decides to fling it over the fence where <laughs> you, a, dog, you heard it hit the puddle whoop. <laughs> where the dog is just waiting for him. Okay, we talk about how Rudy Rudy had a horrible time in this whole movie. <laughs> oh, that's, that's his fucking fault. Um, oh yeah, definitely. Even up to the credits. <laughs> right. Ferris reminds uh, Ferris like like runs up upstairs at the Wrigley game. He had caught a foul ball. Um, and he uses that same baseball and throws it at his stereo, somehow not knocking off stereo. Um, throws it at the <laughs> stereo to turn off the recording right when right when the parents get home and still say, wow, you're really burning up. I don't know, probably because he was running all the way back home. And, uh, of course, he gets away with it, and Ferris reminds him, the audience that life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you could miss it. And that's Ferris Bueller. It's 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 a fucking phenomenal movie. Like, like if you haven't seen Ferris Bueller, or if you haven't at least watched it this year, you know, it, it it's a great reminder of your youth, in my in my opinion. Um, so yeah, that's really what I got for it. Uh, let's get into some takeaways. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was gonna agree with you. Um, Ferris Bueller is one of those movies where. It inspired me <laughs> to ditch school a lot. But whenever I did school, <laughs> I made sure I had an adventure every time. And I had access to subways and buses. So I would literally go to Queens. We would go back to like the lower Manhattan. We're going to downtown Brooklyn. Mom, if you're watching this, I was a complete fuck up. <laughs> I used to just tour the city while you thought I was at school getting an education because of Fergus Ferris Bueller. He, he did that to me. And I'm so glad that they did not remake make this movie do not remake ferris bueller it doesn't need to be remade it does not yep. uh deval who's getting your that guy award ferris bueller <laughs> matthew broderick he's so charismatic in this movie he's just charismatic he shines he got great personality even when he's hamming it up he knows he's hamming it up um the fourth wall breaks are amazing he was dropping gems there's a lot of quotables in this movie Ferris Bueller is one of those classics that will never stop being a classic. It is in the top 10 of the 80s movies. I'm really glad you picked it. It's an awesome movie. That check award. Ooh. I love Jennifer Grey in this movie. I love Jennifer Grey in this movie. I think Mia Sarah would have gotten it, but you're right. Her personality was toned down because Sloan was just one of those kind of like, I'm so amazing. I'm just happy to be here kind of kind of females, sure. you know? Like, I don't know what kind of ride you're taking me on. And it's an adventure for me. And I'm just, I just love you. I'm just here because, you know, you, I, I love the fact that you, just, but Jeannie, Jean, Jennifer Grey just had that shit on lock, you know, and she got the chance to play something different than what you've seen in Dirty Dancing. So it, it, I really liked her character in this movie. So Jennifer Grey got it. I love her. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. No, we, we didn't put baby in the corner this time. You just don't know how to get away with shit. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> um that full award fucking ed rooney get yeah, get get jones up out of there <laughs> ed rooney was doing way too much in this movie way too much it would i would have gave it to cameron at one point but cameron was struggling with some issues you know what i'm saying sure, and sure. his friend was trying to help him this was a right. therapeutic experience for him you know what i'm saying so no ed rooney get get up out of here jeffrey jones you, you gotta get up out of here man Cut that out. Cut that out. All right, so there's a moment in the movie where everything kind of comes down to a slowdown. I think they go swimming and they're still trying to, you know, get well, the Cameron kind of, out of his catatonic, catatonic state. I, I can cut that out. I don't need that. Like, Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, does it hold up? Yeah, surprisingly it does. It does hold up. Does it hold up great? Not really, but it feels like a product of his era. But who didn't want to be, who didn't want to live in the 80s? <laughs> like, yeah. You feel me? You know what I'm Who didn't want to live in a time where things could just be fun like that, you know? And the music, the clothes, the nostalgia, like it killed it. 
Killed it. Uh, and finally, an iconic scene. Iconic scene. So I think you're going to vote to take the scene out. But <laughs> believe it or not, I think the parade is so over the top that I liked it. Because it was like, get off the float. You're cutting school right now. <laughs> and you're on a float singing Twisted Shout. And you even got the dancers coming down the steps. <laughs> like, wow. none of this shit can happen in real life. You know it. And the dad never caught him. That shit didn't make no sense. The dad could have caught him right there. He was on the float right there. The dad just looked down and said, <laughs> But I think the parade was like, you got to see how cool Ferris Bueller was, and it oozed, like, it oozed to everybody else. Like, he was that infectious that he could make the whole downtown just turn up, you know? So I like that. I thought that was cool. All right. Uh, my That Guy Award is going to go to Ferris. Um, mm -hmm. There was a part of me that kind of wanted to give it to Cameron, but this is Ferris's movie. Day in and nah. day out. Ferris... Nah. Ferris is at least a well-adjusted, you know, little shithead that 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 basically that does get away with a lot, but at the same time, you it's not like it's not like he gets away with a lot because it wasn't like thought out. Like he at least had some form of thinking that that that's going that that was going to be there. Um, right. At the same time, I don't feel like Ferris is the kind of guy that like that doesn't like get along with anybody in his family. Like even even Jeannie, I think Jeannie is just irritated with him as a as a person. agreed. I agree. I think he actually loves his sister, to be honest I with think you. He does so too. Yeah. Ferris is Ferris is kind of like one of those guys that like that that you you want to see what happens to him later on. Right. You know, like you want to check up on him if you were a high school friend of his. Right. That's 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 Ferris Bueller. Uh yeah. that chick award, I am gonna give it to Sloan. Um, mainly because Sloan, in a lot of ways, was very mature for her age. Like right. she was well aware of who she was and what she felt like she represented. Um, but she also was one of those types that that you know wasn't going to kind of go above and beyond, you know, above and beyond that. You can genuinely tell that she cares for for Ferris. Yeah, um, because. Nobody would give a best friend that kind of attention, you know, like Cameron when when he went into that cat catatonic straight, uh, right. you know, because she was like really trying to get him to snap out of it because she was she was legitimately worried. And I think right. she realized I think she realized that if she didn't show that she was worried, maybe maybe Ferris might have had different idea different ideas about her. But no, she it felt like she genuinely cared about yeah. everybody everybody involved. Um, right. That full award, I'm with you. Uh, I'm with you on this, Rooney. Like, you're 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 just an asshole to be an asshole. Like, yeah. like you're, you're not actually accomplishing anything at all. Nah. Let's say let's say you catch Ferris. Let's say you catch. Yeah. Ferris. This is still technically his ninth absence. Right? Yeah, it's isn't this. it? Isn't it ten? Is when things. Really, yeah. secondly, secondly, those absences ain't even there no more. Like, what, right. what, what, what are we talking about here? What are we talking about? We also, okay, <laughs> no proof. <laughs> Here's the thing we also kind of have a general idea of the time period of this because I'm not talking about, yes, I know that the game happened June 6, 1985, right? Because I'm a Braves fan, but um, but we knew we knew that that this this time period had to be like April or May of like school's over school's almost oh, over nothing. man like Gosh, and everybody you know. knows it everybody yeah. knows it you, you there the people that people are kneeling down on the clock you know they, yeah. don't, they don't really care anymore so no nah, man you're, you're doing too much you're breaking into people's houses you know yeah that, that was doing crazy. way too what, much way what too happened if what happened if he would have caught ferris and he was actually sick well you gonna beat him up or you gonna bring him back to school right <laughs> you you drag him over there yeah. oh, man. <laughs> You know, call his parents from the crib. Like, hey, I bet your crib right now. And I caught Ferris in the kitchen. Okay, he's sick. He stayed home from school. Right. <laughs> what are you? Why are you in my house? <laughs> it's so stupid. Just it's so. Um, I, I, I think it's so ridiculous that they didn't even think of the ramifications. But then again, maybe he was supposed to be that crazy. You know. I, I guess so. Terrible. Uh, cut that out. I there's not really a a, a, a cut that out. 
Um, right, right. Even the catatonic scene wasn't bad. It's just I didn't need. I didn't need it though. I right. didn't need it. There, there's a lot of really, really funny scenes that add nothing to the plot, like mm-hmm. the nurse who likes to fuck, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which I didn't even cover. Like, like somebody sent a, a, a prostitute to to Ferris's house, yeah. you know, and she had this whole jingle that that was just like. Uh, I, I really hope to uh, to give you a little bit of a pluck because I'm the nurse who likes to. And then the door slams <laughs> on her face and you're like, well, where's the ending that at? <laughs> Only in the, the John Hughes cinematic universe can you right. have a nurse show up like that. <laughs> right, exactly. Oh, man. Um, and uh, let's, does it hold up? For me, it does. Um, this movie's 35 years old. Like when you think of it that way, it's like holy shit, this movie's thirty five years old. But it you is. also feel like this movie, you could find a way to maybe not so much remake it, but you could kind of have kind of like a spiritual thinking about it. You know, where it's like whenever you see like a whole bunch of teenagers get together and just kind of escape out for a week, in a way, it kind of reminds me of this movie because it's like everybody wants to have that sense of freedom. Everybody wants to have that sense of I, I don't really want to do this right now. Even when I right. call out, even when I call out of work, like I just, you know, you call out of work and you kind of got a vibe at that point. It's like, holy fuck, what am I going to do with my day? <laughs> because that, that's what you feel like, right? I, I, I've I've done it, and some of the best ones is the ones you don't plan. You know what I'm saying? Right. You know, Ferris Bueller just happened to be planning this one. You know what I'm saying? He do. But but it's like if you knew that like. You know, when 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 it comes unplanned, it's even better. I love when, those. I when, love when those. Sit there afterwards, and you're just like, wow, that was that was a fucking great time. And I've had a couple of them. Um, yeah. Now that COVID is over, kind of. Um, like, sort of. Hey, sort of. Sort of. Kind of. Sort of. Sort of. <laughs> um, you know, maybe I'm I'm hoping for more opportunities like that. Uh, and finally, iconic scene. I struggled with this one. Because I could easily say the guys in the Ferrari, you know, mm-hmm. because that that is just a whole, whole representation of this film. Um, I think I'm going to give it to the ending montage of him running back to back. Yeah, that's to- good. That's good. That's good. That montage was awesome because it's a great it's a great '80s montage of mm-hmm. like everything you kind of want from the character, like yeah. like like you know. If it, Ferris is going to take whatever opportunity he can. When he straight up breaks into those that that people's houses, like, don't get yeah, up, <laughs> Dude, right? I'm like, I'm like, yo, oh man, that's good. I love it. Did he steal the drink from the guy that was barbecuing? He straight, he straight up like <laughs> like snatched it and started drinking. Yeah, that scene that scene is so John Hughes. <laughs> <laughs> that it's like it's so beautiful. They tried to mimic it a little bit in the Spider-Man Homecoming. I said, leave that scene alone. Y'all don't Please. need to be doing that shit. <laughs> um, all right, let's get into some quick hits. Wrap this thing up. I, I was trying to make this about uh, an hour. Uh, I definitely did a lot more talking than uh, I probably should have. We're, I think we're like at about an hour. We're good. Uh, John Hughes told Ben Stein, who had a degree in economics, to present an actual economics lecture in his scene. So therefore, nothing that Stein said was scripted outside of the roll call. Um, to produce the desired drug guy effect for his role as a drug addict in the police station, Charlie Sheen stayed awake for more than 48 hours before this scene was shot. Wow. Good job. Good method acting. Good job, buddy. Uh, Mia Sarah says that Matt Broderick <laughs> actually tickled her feet and knees to get her to laugh naturally in the tax cap scene. That's awesome. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um... Let's see. First Lady Barbara Bush paraphrased the film in her 1990 commem- uh, commencement address at, uh, oh God, Wellesley College. Uh, find the joy in life because as Ferris Bueller said on his day off, life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you couldn't miss it. Responding to the audience's enthusiastic applause, she added, I'm not going to tell George. You clapped more for Ferris than you clapped for George. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Uh, after working together on Weird Science, uh, John Hughes offered Bill Paxton the role of the garage attendant. However, Paxton turned down the role because he felt the role was too small. He admitted that he regretted turning it down because Hughes never offered him a role ever again. Um, 
Wow. He was Chet. You're good, Bill. You're fine. You're Chet. You're good. <laughs> you're right. a shithead in fucking weird science. So we're good. <laughs> According to the Inside Story documentary, Charlie Sheen's character's name is actually Garth Volbeck. There was going to be a whole backstory to his character and family. It was also revealed that the Volbecks are the family to whom Ferris's mom was showing the house and her job as a realtor. The fucking Vermont deal. <laughs> That's right. If you look closely, the tow truck that tows Rooney's car is from Volbeck Wrecking Service. Also deleted. Glad backstory. we didn't get the backstory. I'm glad we didn't get the one shot of, of, of Charlie Sheen in there. <laughs> right. Also, a deleted uh, backstory shows that Ferris and Garth were friends in the eighth grade. Uh, Garth's family is pretty messed up, and Ferris tried to help him and be his friend. But Garth eventually dropped out of high school and wound up in the police station next to Jeannie. That's why Ferris is so in town giving Cameron a good time. He blames himself for not helping Garth enough when he could. Crash. Um, <laughs> Yeah, delete it. Delete. Not, not a fan of it, personally. Um, but that's interesting, um, though. That's mad interesting. I didn't know that. Let's see. A question. Question. I do have a question before you move on. How many movies have Charlie Sheen done before this? Up into this? Uh, I'm going to say, man, this. I mean, this was definitely one of his earlier roles. Um, right, because Wall Street and shit didn't come out till like later, right? No, that was that was later. Um. Platoon was 86, Wraith was 86, Wall Street was 87, Major League was 89. So he technically wasn't even really like a star yet. No, but but he was because he was in Red Dawn. He was in Red Okay, got you. Oh, okay, got you, got you. And Wraith came out after, I think, maybe. Possibly. Yeah, the Wraith. <laughs> Nobody watched the Wraith. I'm the only one that loves it. Um, he was also in Luke. I love the rave. He was also in The Boy Next Door. There you go. All right, continue. <laughs> um, all right, I got two more. Mm -hmm. uh, according to John Hughes, Cameron was based in large part on a friend of his in high school. He was sort of a lost person. His family neglected him, so he took that as a license to really pamper himself. When he was legitimately sick, he actually felt good because it was difficult and tiring to have to invent diseases. And when he actually had something, he was relaxed. And... Okay, two more, because I like I, the second one is pretty. Keep good. going, man. I love the facts. Keep going. <clears throat> the parade scene took multiple days of filming. Matthew Broderick spent some time practicing the dance moves. Was very scared. Broderick said, "Fortunately, the sequence was uh, carefully choreographed beforehand. We worked out all the moves by rehearsing in the little studio. It was shot on two Saturdays in the heart of downtown Chicago. That's insane. Uh, Killed the it. Day, the first day was during a real parade, and John got some very long shots." Then radio stations carried announcements inviting people to take part in a John Hughes movie. The word got around fast, and 10,000 people showed up. For the final shot, I turned around and saw a river of And people. guess what? He probably didn't have to pay none of them for that. Yeah. Nobody got paid. I put, <laughs> I put my hands up at the end of the number and, and heard this huge roar. I can understand how rock stars feel. That kind of reaction feeds you. And hmm. finally... Most of the license place, uh, plates are abbreviations of titles of films by John Hughes. For example, mm -hmm. Katie's VCTN, National Lampoon's Vacation, Genie's mm -hmm. BBC, The Breakfast Club, Tom's MMOM, which is Mr. Mom, Rooney's F, uh, 4FBDO, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. The exception is Cameron's Ferrari, seen when Cameron first pulls out of the garage, the license plate of which reads NRBOUS, Nervous. <laughs> and that's, got you. that's all we got for you guys uh thank you guys so much for joining us this was a blast uh d brown this is always amazing to to do this with you i really enjoy uh hop uh, hopping in here and just kind of talking 80s movies with you i'll, I'll talk 80s movies all fucking day long yo 80s movies is our staple it's what we grew up on um i could watch them at any time of the day, if they're on, it's it's instant nostalgia. So Ferris Bueller was special to me because um it, it's just the one man. Ferris Bueller is in that in that one. It's not my favorite John Hughes movie, but it's it's there. It's yeah. it's it's up there. It's in there. Um, uh, D Brown, let the let the people know where they can find you. Um, 
Yeah, the D Brown is um, wherever you want me to be. I'm mostly on Back to the Classics. Uh, Cinema Rehab got some new episodes coming up. Um, if you do need to reach me, just holla at me at my very difficult, horrible IG name, <laughs> BKLV Negrito. But I got all the necessary links so you guys can find me. Um, of course, the our Facebook page, our Back to the Classics page. Um, just tap in with me. I'm talking. I'm always talking. I need to shut up sometimes, but I am always talking. Come holler at me. As I figure out my Twitter and as I figure out what I'm doing with my YouTube, just um, bear with me. Don't worry. Good things are coming. Um, where can we find you, Danger Now? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, at home or sleep most days. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. Ben Stein's IG. class, sleeping. <laughs> You can find me on Facebook, IG, and Twitter at David Danger Neff. I'm the co-host here at Back to the Classics with my guy Jay, who's apparently gained a second second dick attached to him. So <laughs> good for him. We'll give you chronicles of details of that story as it kind of goes on. This is exactly why he couldn't be on this episode. <laughs> uh, and, and, and in case you were curious, on the hip, uh, not <laughs> not branched out on top of the first one. Oh my you god, know, that shit is bad funny. <laughs> So, so, uh, so yeah, so you, you, you can find him and all and that journey, uh, from the back to the classics <laughs> Facebook page. Oh my um, gosh. Uh, yeah, you can also find us everywhere, uh, everywhere they listen to podcasts, um, our YouTube channel, uh, check us out, uh, check us out via beat network. Uh, we're, we're one of the playlists on, uh, on that. Um, just type in Beat Network with an exclamation point. Can't miss us. Yeah. Uh, BeatNetworkOnline.com. In the event that you guys want to decide to kind of uh, throw some money our way, scroll down to the bottom, click that donate button, and I can guarantee you we will be very, very, very happy uh, to do so. Um, we should, like, for the next 80s episode, it should do, like, Don Johnson. R.B. <laughs> I can't hear your R.B. <laughs> Yeah, because we got one more. We got to end it strong. We got. To, we need the quintessential '80s anthem. That was it. <laughs> Terrible, I know. <laughs> Michael Jackson's "Hero of the World" is what it's going to wind up being. <laughs> and then beat it. Time. It's going to be beat it. We find all the songs oh. that got beat in the title. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my. <laughs> Too funny. <laughs> um. So yeah. That's where you can find us. Thank you guys so much for uh, for checking us out. Um, happy. Uh, I'm still laughing at Jay. <laughs> happy 428. Um, make sure you leave out your uh, your uh, weed and cookies out for Snoop as he uh, as uh, you know he comes to pay you guys a visit. Are uh, your purple Urkel the Stefan? We heard that's the new product out. This yeah, purple Urkel. The purple Urkel. And, and, you know, uh, do you think? Yeah. That's that's all I got. We will see you guys next week with uh, wrapping up 80s April. And uh, once again, I want to thank Duvall uh, joining me here today. Go check out Ferris Bueller, and we'll see you guys next week. Peace out. <laughs>